Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this third and last day of the EU Sustainable Energy Week uh, 2020. It's my pleasure to guide you through this session that we have organized for you, uh, where we'll be debating the role of women in the energy transition and how to mainstream uh, gender uh, equality in the sector, energy sector. We have uh, an extraordinary lineup of speakers with us today, and we have organized a very uh, interactive session with you, the audience. So we'll have plenty of opportunities to intervene and raise your points. My name is Paula Bromarquez. I'm the head of unit in charge of uh, renewable energy uh, in the European Commission. And I'm also uh, the uh, equality coordinator in DG Energy. Um, we have uh, today a uh, uh, a very uh, rich agenda uh, and as I said at the beginning we'll be debating so the role of, uh, of, of women in the energy transition. What we observe today is that we have still a strong imbalance in the energy sector. Uh, it's still a, a workplace uh, mostly for men but of course we see the energy transition as a great opportunity also to balance this situation. Uh, for, in, for instance, uh, we already observed today that the share of women in the renewable energy sector is higher than the energy sector as a whole. Also in the Commission, there have been important changes brought by uh, President von der Leyen. She has uh, outlined and indicated that uh, equality and inclusion uh, was one is one of the uh, our political objectives and for the first time this commission has a commissioner in charge of equality issues commissioner dali and we'll have the pleasure of having a member of her cabinet with us uh, later on I, I will just outline who we have with us uh, to speak. So first, we'll, uh, we'll uh, listen to uh, Commissioner Kari Simpson in charge of energy. My pleasure to, to welcome her. And then we'll have a, a, very, um, a very interesting panel with great speakers. We have Alice Van Kuhn, who is a member of the European Parliament. We have Gokce Mete uh, from Women in Energy, Climate and Sustainability Foundation. We have Christine Leans from the Global Women Network for the Energy Transition. We also have Penti Pukaka, member of the Nordic Corporation and Chief Counselor at the Finnish Energy Department. And finally, we have Eva Gerards, uh, Deputy Head uh, of the Cabinet of Commissioner Dali, so in charge of equality. Later on, we'll also be joined by my Director General, Director General for Energy, Mrs. Uh, Dita Yu Jorgensen. So, um, just perhaps to, uh, I would like to, um, uh, to invite you to consider two questions and, and, uh, and uh, that we would like to debate here. Uh, one of them is how do we bring initiatives together to change the situation? And the second is what are the benefits of the, uh, for the clean energy transition of having a more balanced representation of women? Uh, I would like to ask actually the panelists who I introduced and also the audience um, three questions, uh, like in a quiz. And this will enable you also to get used or get familiar with the slider which we'll be using all along the, the event, uh, to receive questions from your side, from the audience, also later in the discussion. Uh, when you see the poll appearing on your slido, you can vote. So I'll ask uh, kindly the technicians to do so. And the first question would be, uh, at the current rate of progress, how long do you think it will take to reach gender parity? Can you please vote? OK, I think we stop here. This session is definitely uh, needed. Um, yeah. Perhaps we stop now. Uh, very good. The correct answer is 108 years. Quite impressive. But congratulations, you are on the right page. The second question is the following. According to the World Bank, in how many countries can women be considered to be on equal legal standing with men? Mm 
Okay, let's now see the result. I think it's more or less stabilized in terms of uh, trends. Yes, the correct answer was eight. And the third and last question. What is, what is the third question? Uh, what is the percentage of women in the oil and gas and in the renewable energy sector? We speak here in global terms, so world. Please vote. Okay, and a correct answer is 22% in oil and gas and 32% in uh, renewable energy. So there is still a, a long way to go here in terms of uh, uh, balanced uh, uh, gender representation. Okay, thank you very much for having um, tested with me the Slido system. And now it is my great pleasure to give the floor to Mrs. Kadri Simpson, uh, Commissioner in Charge of, uh, of Energy. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. And good morning, dear ladies and uh, dear gentlemen, of course. Uh, in 1843, Ada Lovelace wrote to that uh, many considered to be the first computer program. Yet today, IT is a male-dominated field. Marie Curie uh, is, to this day, the only person to win the Nobel Prize for two different disciplines, chemistry and physics. But girls are still often told that natural sciences are not for them. Seven decades ago, Rosalind Franklin discovered the double helix uh, structure of the DNA and saw her male colleagues get the Nobel for it. And even in 2020, labs can be unfriendly places for women. Human beings have a bad habit of putting things into overly simplistic boxes. Science, engineering, and the color of blue are for men. Childcare, clothes, and pink are for women. If you have to choose right now, where would you put the energy? And I suspect many would choose the blue box because energy is associated with pipes and plants, um, electrolyzers and turbines, geopolitics and conflict. And um, the numbers would back up. We mean um, make up only 22% of the workforce in the energy sector, a rather depressing state of affairs. Things are changing, however, and it's about a time. First and most fundamentally, our views on the role of women in the society have been changing for a while and continue to develop. Female CEOs and political leaders are no longer anomalies. Um, also, um, um, they still get paid less and are criticized for their ambition, but they are there. And we have all witnessed how women leaders can handle the COVID crisis or the way Greta Thunberg has galvanized an entire generation. But we have proof closer to home as well. This commission has made it crystal clear that equality between women and men is imperative for us. It's not just words. Nothing makes it clearer that you are in favor of empowering women than actually giving women the power. I have the privilege of serving as the first female EU Commissioner for Energy in this century, as part of the team of the first woman ever to lead the Commission. And in turn, I have the good fortune to be supported by the first ever female Director General for Energy. So also my first appointments were to senior women managers in the Directorate General, and half of the members of my cabinet are women. This is not lip service, uh, this is real change. Second, it's not just the role of women that is shifting. Energy isn't staying the same either. We are on the brink of the biggest transition in energy since we moved from wood to fossil fuels. In a couple of decades, we need to go from coal plants and oil drilling to zero emissions. Fighting the biggest challenge of our generation the form of climate change while 
disregarding the contribution of half of humanity is like trying to box this Muhammad Ali with this one hand tied behind your back. The challenge is already tough enough without making it unnecessary harder for ourselves. As we are transforming the energy sector, we are going to need all the talent and experience we can get out hands on. And while we are at it, let's make sure that this transformation isn't just about placing one technology with another. Every energy revolution has brought with it massive social change. And this is our chance to build something better, fairer and stronger. We can create not just new jobs, but a new ways of doing things. Not just new solutions, but new opportunities. And we know that the imbalance between men and women is smaller in the renewable sector. Uh, so this is a good starting point. I know that um, it's often uncomfortable for women to talk about how they are not valued enough or lack opportunities. But um, we must continue to talk about it until it's no longer necessary. And I want to remind men uh, as well that uh, this isn't just a women's fight. It's our common cause. Um, but I'm a pra pragmatic person. And while talking is important, I'm always more interested in what we can do. This commission has already come out with a strategy for women's rights um, that will be the basis of our work also in, uh, in the energy sector. So no matter the policy we are planning, we must reflect whether it makes the situation of women better or worse. We know, for example, that energy poverty hits women harder as they often raise the family alone and they are stuck with unaffordable uh, energy bills. So when we come out with a renovation wave this autumn, we will need to tackle also this top. One thing we need for supporting women in the energy sector is uh, better data. You cannot fix a problem when you don't quite know what the root of the problem is. So uh, gender disaggregated uh, data about women and energy is the EU in scars. That's why uh, DGNR will commission a thorough study to help us understand the situation better and be better able to address it. Now, our own team, the colleagues in the DG, have set up the Gender Equality Network to make sure we give women the space they deserve in our policies and in our organization. And finally, I hope that today's event and the focus we have put on women throughout the Sustainable Energy Week will also contribute to making our sector a more equal place. Gentlemen and ladies, I have no illusion that um, we know the answer to every, qu to every question. Um, but if this question is so complex as to how to ensure a fair and sustainable society, um, then discussions are needed. That's why I'm especially glad to have this discussion where an extremely distinguished panel. I'm looking forward to their views on how we can make progress fast and how it can benefit the green transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for your very inspiring keynote. You raised a number of issues that I'm sure our panelists are going to debate further in our discussion. Thank you so much for having joined us uh, this morning. Um, I'd like now to move to our panelists. <clears throat> so as I introduced before, we have uh, five uh, speakers. Um, I would like to ask uh, if uh, you could uh, limit your presentations to four or five minutes. So in order to uh, be able to leave time uh, for the questions and for the for interaction with the with the audience. Um, in this regard, I invite all the audience members to submit questions and views to the panelists, but using the Slido. You can also vote on the questions that have already been submitted in order to recommend them. So if, um, if you agree, I would like to start. And uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Alice Ba, member of the European uh, Parliament. Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
And uh, thank you, Madam Commissioner Simpson. Uh, it is an honor to take part of this important uh, session, and I look forward to hear the perspectives and the ideas from the experts on this panel. When people speak about sustainable development in developing countries, the empowerment of women is acknowledged as in an important goal. Everyone knows that women in developing countries experiences energy poverty differently and more severely than men. People also know that women in developing countries uh, can be powerful actors for change and that their involvement in energy solutions, their competences is critical for reaching sustainable development goals. There are, are also, as all of you know, many positive examples in developing countries where women have proven to be driving providers of sustainable energy solutions at the community level. It is therefore especially frustrating when this knowledge is not sufficiently acknowledged when structuring the energy transition and the development of renewable energy in Europe. All of the common knowledge I just described is equally important for the energy transition in the EU. Yet, it is a well-known fact that the energy sector in Europe, as many other technological sectors, is dominated by male professionals, male competences, and this uh, tradition continues to exist in the renewable uh, energy sector. There is also an extremely limited recognition of the problem of energy poverty within the member states, especially the gender dimension of the problem. Women in the EU are more likely than men to live in energy poverty, which also limits their participation in, in the energy transition. As a Green member of the European Parliament, I focus my work on the intersection between climate, gender and social issues. While there are many different topics that can be discussed with the team of this discussion. I am mostly interested in the very important issue of achieving a fair energy transition that leaves no woman behind. It is important that we all realize, understand and take into account the importance of gender equality and women empowerment in the transition. It is also important uh, because for the sake of reducing, we need not to enhancing an existent uh, inequalities. Climate change solutions uh, uh, will not be an effective unless we ensure the participation of women at all levels. For this, the concept of energy citizenship and the idea of a democratization of energy is essential. Empowering citizens to be more active in energy sector allows them both participate and benefit from the transition and has the potential to be truly gender inclusive. It can also help bring about a change in social attitude towards environmental challenges and therefore the need for such a transition. The transition needs to be fair. We cannot let the transition reinforce existing gender inequalities and put additional burden on those groups in our societies who are already the most vulnerable. Significantly, turning a blind eye to the gendered nature of any sector of our economy will lead to gendered effects of the policies we implement. In the energy sector, it is of utmost importance both that women are involved 
in the development of renewable energy and that we build access to energy where the needs of all citizens are equally addressed. For that, we need, we need to apply a gender mainstreaming approaches and we need to use tools such as gender analysis and gender budgeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice, for your insights. I'm sure that you will raise uh, uh, questions from the audience and then uh, we will uh, get more into depth in some of the things that you, you have uh, uh, shared with us. I'd like now to suggest to move uh, to Gokje uh, from the Women in Energy, Climate and Sustainability Foundation. Um, you are working, Gokje, on providing better knowledge on the situation of women in energy. Um, from our experience, uh, since uh, we have set up this uh, network on equality in DG Energy, as mentioned by, uh, by the Commissioner, um, the lack of data in the EU is one of the difficulties we are really facing when we try to address the topic. Uh, could you share with us your views on the role of science and academia on this issue? Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. Um, so um, I would like to actually ask if we can bring up my slides um, so that I could provide you with a, um, a brief overview of the Women in uh, Energy, Climate and Sustainability Foundation um, to start with. Um, so the WECS, in short, is a bottom-up initiative um, driven by Women in Energy, Climate and Sustainability. Um, it's a public foundation. Um, with, um, that is aimed at promoting gender equality and as a crucial enabler of the energy transition and the transition to a climate neutral um, economy in Europe and worldwide. Um, at the WECS, we have a bold vision for Europe, um, a Europe that is a global leader in the fight against climate change but as an, and a global champion um, in unlocking female talent and leadership potential in energy, climate, and sustainability ecosystem. So we do see the synergies um, and, and opportunities for building the synergies between the European Gender Strategy and the European Green Deal. And um, in order to move towards this common goal, uh, we bring together, um, uh, if we can go to the next slide, And uh, the next slide, please. Um, so in order to move towards this common goal, we bring together um, key uh, stakeholders um, for driving change on the ground. So we work with academia um, and the researchers uh, from universities and think tanks across Europe and internationally. They constitute a unique brain pool to advance our insights and create um, concrete pathways. Um, policymakers and representatives from relevant international organizations play a key role uh, at the WECS, providing strategic steering uh, of the foundation and setting our priorities through um, our cooperation with the private sector, uh, we seek to develop uh, standards in HR policies and practices, ensuring equal employment and career development opportunities for women in the sector. Um, and um, as part of our cooperation with NGOs, uh, we seek to develop, uh, we seek to combine efforts um, in outreach and awareness raising. Um, so the uh, WCS Foundation is a hub for all these stakeholders. Uh, enabling project development, knowledge sharing, and best practice exchange. But I am um, uh, proud to uh, lead the research and academic engagement at the WECS. Um, and I will uh, briefly now focus on the importance of um, research and academia in, uh, in fostering uh, the gender agenda. So let me just briefly mention three points. Um, first, as mentioned already by the Commissioner, um, dedicated research, so dedicated research and knowledge um, on the not only data but research on the uh, interdependencies 
um, between energy transition and gender, and gendered analysis of just transition is only just emerging. So science and research, therefore, can play a crucial role in deepening our insights into, into this topic and helping us create pathways and methodologies um, to implement change on the ground. Um, let me give you an example. Um, in a pioneering study, the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, which I will be joining this summer, um, they carried out, um, they recently explored the current, uh, the state of knowledge and academic research on how diffusion of low carbon technologies impact gender and social equality. And the findings are quite interesting uh, because their study shows that um, that it's not, it's not just the technology that determines the outcome of the transition, but it's rather the ways in which the technology interplays with existing socio-cultural, socio-economic and institutional contexts, meaning that renewable energy um, sector will not automatically lead to social inclusion, gender equality, just because it's green. Secondly, uh, research and academia are instrumental in developing the talent pool for female uh, of female um, energy and climate professionals. Um, apart from educating young women to pursue a career in the energy field, um, academia unites women um, and, and enables them to share their passion. And we have such networks as the Women in uh, Women and Inclusivity. Uh, in Sustainable Energy Network, WISER in short, and Women in Energy and Climate Law Network. Now, at WECF, we, uh, we are connected to both of them. Um, and it's really important that uh, we pursue this uh, capacity building and networking opportunities. Men are good at them and women can be better, but we need to do it not by just reaching out to other women, but women beyond our own industry. Um, and at the WCS, as I mentioned earlier, we bring together different stakeholders and we create synergies between uh, the research academic uh, professionals and academic world and policymakers. And this brings me to my third point and last point, um, advancing research in the field of a just and inclusive uh, transition to um, transition and gender equality is key to inform a robust policy framework policy strategies that are aiming to boost the gender equality dimension of a climate neutral, resilient um, economy. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gatche, for, for, um, for your insights. Um, I'd like now to move to, uh, to Christine Lins uh, from the Global Women Network uh, for the Energy Transition. And Christine, one of the things we would be eager to hear from you is about the guidance that you have issued on how to promote women talent in the energy sector. I know that you also have a uh, slide PowerPoint. I would just appreciate if you could, um, if you could uh, just uh, use five minutes uh, of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paola. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for the invitation to this session. It's always inspiring to talk about uh, women in the energy transition and um, having been myself more than 24 years in the renewables field, uh, I witnessed that there are more and more of us, uh, which is great, uh, but still, as we have heard in, uh, in the introduction, uh, there is still a long way to go. If I can have my next slide, please. The Global Women's Network, or GWNet, uh, is a um, non-profit uh, international association that was created in 2017 with the aim to advance the global energy transition by empowering women in energy through interdisciplinary networking, advocacy training uh, and uh, mentoring. It is an initiative that was created by women from different jurisdictions uh, working in this space and uh, that have witnessed over the years uh, that uh, there is an underrepresentation, and that probably uh, one of the things that is missing uh, are role models in this space for younger women uh, to, to guide them in, in their careers. Uh, we are uh, working on uh, providing connections, so we organize networking events back to back with major energy conferences now, moving more and more to the virtual space. Uh, we work on uh, providing information uh, on women in energy because very often data are not disaggregated 
we do this in partnership with different actors and we provide services such as mentoring programs um, in, in different uh, parts of the world and also in different subjects such as wind. We are currently starting one together with the World Bank and ESMAP on women in energy storage. Uh, if you're working in this space, uh, check out our website. You can still apply until uh, Sunday this week uh, to participate in this program. If I can have my next slide, please. Um, yeah, the, the energy transition, and I think this is very important to bear in mind, is a multidimensional, complex, uh, non-linear process. It will radically reform the existing energy supply and uh, energy demand systems, and it goes really beyond replacing fossil fuels. It changes consumption, distribution, and investment patterns, and uh, it brings new coalitions uh, and needs uh, new capabilities of actors, and of course, um, needs new social technical regimes of policy, regulation, mindset, uh, beliefs, and social practices. It requires behavior change, uh, innovation, integration across all sectors, and it uh, demands diverse backgrounds, capabilities, and perspectives, and a large uh, and diverse uh, talent pool. If I can have my next slide, please. And this is, I think, where really uh, women come in. Uh, we know that uh, problems that are tackled by men and women often uh, achieve the better solutions. We have at the moment about 11 million people working globally in the renewable space. According to IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, this number is supposed uh, to increase to 42 million uh, by uh, 2050. And that's very clear that uh, in order to reach this and in order also to give the industry uh, the necessary talent pool, we need uh, to, to drive this uh, gender equality and bring more women uh, in this space. If I could have the slide uh, that I have there on the, the next after next, uh, please. Um, yeah, and then one more, please. Yes, uh, there we go. We have recently published a study uh, on women for sustainable energy, where we analyzed strategies on how women's talent uh, for transformational change can be fostered. It contains an overview of women's current participation in the sustainable energy workforce in developed and emerging economies and uh, also highlights the benefits of diversity and inclusion in the workplace, uh, contains industry interviews and gives good practice examples and recommendations for a more gender diverse sector, because clearly if uh, it is more diverse and we've seen this, and that's also highlighted in the study, uh, more diversity brings better results for companies. And we are convinced it will bring a faster and a more inclusive energy transition. And I think that's what we all aim for. Thank you very much, back to you, Paula. Thank you so much, Christine. Very interesting piece of work. Um, and thank you very much also for having respected the time. And like this, we can have um, enough time for, for the questions afterwards. And now allow me to move to our next speaker, to Penti Buhaka, member of the Nordic Corporation and also a chief counselor at the Finnish Energy Department. Penti, um, we also often see the Nordic countries being um, indicated as uh, examples to follow when it comes to equality. Um, what is, uh, how much is this specifically re relevant for the energy transition from your perspective, a Nordic perspective? Uh, good morning. Thank you, Paula. Uh, and uh, nice to see you there. And it's my pleasure to be here discussing these very important issues. Yes. Uh, we, we have uh, big challenges, like uh, the Commissioner mentioned. First is um, uh, recovery from the COVID-19, very topic, very rapid actions needed. And at the same time, we have to put our efforts to, to tackle the climate change problems in, in globally, not, uh, not only in, in Europe, of course. And uh, there are uh, many, many actions needed for that. Uh, we need a lot of financing, and, and we are very pleased to see that the Commission has been active to, to, to raise this question on, on member states, and, and um, I'm sure that we can direct these, these uh, funds towards uh, these actions needed. Uh, but um, even, the, even then, uh, with, with the money, we can do not to do so much if there are not the measures, policies, and talented people doing these actions. So, as important is to have a talented uh, uh, experts, workforce, 
to implement and then and, and, uh, invest for these, these actions. So the gender issue, actually, it's very, very simple for from the hours perspective, from the Nordic perspectives. It's evident. I think we don't need any more discussions here that it's evident that the, the workforce, the, the results in public sector and in private companies are much better if we have gender uh, equality working for this together. If you think a team only having men or the women, you can imagine that it's not, not the best uh, situation for the global problems. Or even even the wider perspective, gender issue. If you have only Finns or only Swedish or only only, you know, only Spanish doing the, these issues together, without having cultural and under the different uh, younger and older people working together. So we see this equal um, uh, approach very important to get the best results. We are very practical and result orientated so we see this this as as a, the, the best solution when we promote equal equality in, in the society and and as as you said Paula, we have managed in the nordic countries quite well as uh, many many developed country also to achieve uh, let's say at the education level the, the equality between boys and girls in our uh, universities course about the same amount, girls and boys, studying even the technical uh, branches. But our problem in our case in Nordic is that uh, somehow they vanish. The girls are vanishing when when they uh, choose their careers. They are not. They are not. There are not so more. So so many. Any any uh, any more there. They are doing other careers. Or even if they go in to energy sector, in energy industries, it seems that big part of, uh, of women are leaving uh, after two or three years. And there are some evidence that, that the one reason is that they, they can't make their career going so rapidly uh, forward than, than men can. And of course, uh, the, for example, the parental um, leaves uh, seems to be one one reason, and so we have to improve our our financial issues for the parental leaves, and also the attitude when the people come after the parental leave working again, they, they haven't lost their ability to, to work as they used to be, and and it's partly the, the, the this attitude question, but of of course partly was financing and, and some other respect issues there in, in companies, in, 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 in organizations. And, and then also somebody asked already in the slide about the energy poverty. And, and it's a very big issue we have to tackle at the same time. But as Commissioner said, these problems are very complicated. At the same time, we have to leave this uh, and ban the subsidies for fossil fuels. But if we do so, so in, in the de developing countries, a lot of uh, poor people suffer for, for the price of the, of, the, of the energy. So we have to tackle at the same time these, these uh, climate change issues, the price of energy, and energy power are the questions in, in a fair way to, 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 to come to the end. So, so I have used my time. Uh, a lot of issues to raise uh, to raise out after this to the guest, uh, when we discuss more. But this was, the, I think, the, my starting points. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penty, for your insights. Um, very interesting um, from your experience, the things that uh, you've been telling us. And to complete the panel, it's now my pleasure to um, to invite Eva Gerard. As I introduced, Eva is currently the uh, deputy head of the in charge of equality. And uh, I'd like to say that Eva has a very interesting uh, background because uh, she's an energy expert. Uh, and uh, in her new capacity as member of the cabinet of uh, Commissioner Dali, she was uh, equally uh, she was involved in the preparation and the adoption of the very first Commission strategy on gender equality. Uh, Eva, what can you 
say as a reaction to what we have just heard from the four uh, speakers in terms of uh, what the Commission can do and is going to do in this regard. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Paula, and uh, thanks to these to the other speakers for these excellent presentations. Very, very interesting. Um, I would like to briefly present the um, European Gender Equality Strategy that was adopted earlier this year in March by Commissioner Dali. But um, first of all, I would like to say um, Commissioner Dali is responsible for the equality portfolio, and that is not only gender equality, but that uh, in, is to tackle discrimination in in all possible areas for example um, when it comes to uh, the discrimination of of roma people of lgbti people discrimination according to ethnic or racial origin age or disability um, and for this year we had the gender equality strategy but there will be also a strategy on roma and the lgbti strategy Yesterday, the college discussed also about the problem of racism in Europe, and we might hear uh, about this later this year as well. About the gender equality strategy. Um, I will be brief and only present the parts that are relevant for our discussion today. One principle is to tackle gender stereotypes. These are society expectations of what we want, what we, society expects from girls and boys, how they have to behave and how they should be. And these stereotypes can limit the aspirations of girls. They can limit their choices and the freedom to do what they want. And therefore, we need to do something about it. These stereotypes are already um, transmitted very early in age, sometimes already in kindergarten or school. And I have to say, the, the European school is not much better than, than other schools. If I see the learning material of my kids, they are very, very gender stereotyped. For example, boys, they all want to become pilots and policemen, and the girls want to be dancers or nurses. Um, we also see that, for example, when it comes to artificial intelligence, such stereotypes can be perp uh, perpetuated. Um, because we know that the vast majority of IT programmers are men and uh, they often design computer programs according to the male needs, to the, to the expectations of male users. And therefore, um, the, the needs of women are sometimes not taken into account enough. So the, the strategy proposes um, actions to tackle these stereotypes and, um, and these, these lack of women needs um, to be taken into account. Then it also tries to address the gender pay gap, because in the EU we have a gender and a pension pay gap. The, the pay gap for women is that they earn on average 16% less than men. And in their pension age, they have about 30% less than men. And uh, that is one of the reasons why women are more affected by poverty. This is what Alice uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, energy poverty is, is a topic that is more relevant for women because they are just, we have more women in poverty than men. And what we believe is that when discrimination, when information about pay levels is available, it is easier for women to detect gaps and to prove uh, discrimination. Because of a lack of transparency, many women do not know and they cannot prove that they have been underpaid. And for this reason, we propose that later this year, we will make a legal proposal for binding pay transparency measures. This will come in, in autumn of this year. Then we're trying to close the gender gap in the labor market because we have also less women in work than men on average. And when women work, there's, a, there's more of them who work part-time than men. And uh, we have already addressed this in the Work-Life Balance Directive. This is about uh, parental leave for both parents, mothers and fathers. This is um, about minimum, minimum standards when you have children that you can also take some more holidays or when you have to take care of, of elderly, for example, of the parents. This uh, work-life balance directive is in force 
but the transposition deadline is not yet over. It, it will only be in 2022. But we are helping member states and working very, very closely with member states to guide them so that they use this time well and to have uh, um, compliant uh, legislative measures in the member states at the time of the, the transition deadline. Then we're also monitoring gender equality through the European semester. For example, we are uh, closely monitoring if member states are giving the wrong tax incentive for, um, for example, financial incentives or disincentives for second earners. Because in some member states, we have a situation where this tax system fosters very much a system where the second earner is not encouraged to, to work full time. And that is, of course, in the vast majority of cases, the woman. So we are addressing this as well. Then we are trying also to, to address the, the lead gap. We want to have more women in leading positions. Currently, we have only 7% of board members and of board shares and 7.7% of CEOs in the EU large companies are women. And uh, we are trying to address this by the work by the women on board um, directive. This is a directive the Commission made already as a proposal in 2012. But the negotiations in the Council have been very, very difficult. So this is currently stuck because there is not a majority for this proposal at the moment. So we are hoping to be able to unblock this. We are talking with the, with people and especially also with our president who has put this in her political guidelines that uh, she would really like to move on this file. In leading in society means also leading in um, parliament, so to, to that women are represented in parliaments. At the moment, we have only 32% of women um, members in national parliaments. In the 2019 European elections, there were almost 40% women elected as MEPs. And that is a progress towards um, the former mandate of 2014. The Commission decided to lead by example with a commitment to reach gender balance of 50% at all levels of Commission management by the end of 2024, by the end of this mandate. Um, there is something new about the gender equality strategy that we didn't have before, and that is that the strategy follows a dual approach. So we have these targeted measures in the areas that I mentioned, but we also introduced gender mainstreaming. And that means that the Commission will enhance gender mainstreaming by systematically including a gender perspective in all pol policies the Commission has. For example, when it comes to the Green Deal, the digital transition, health, demographic change, or the budget. We're trying to always put a gender perspective in. This is particularly our job in, in Cabinet Dali, but there has also been a task force installed that supports us in this. And um, they are looking, for example, at inter-service consultations. And if the gender perspective has not been taken into account, we are, we are trying to get it in. This is uh, our approach and our ideas, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Eva. Extremely interesting, uh, very ambitious agenda, very welcome agenda uh, of this commission uh, in, when it comes to equality and in particular gender equality. Uh, and we'll be following uh, very closely all these proposals that are, are will be coming soon. Um, we have heard our, our panelists and now I would like to suggest that uh, we um, look at the questions that have been, uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, placed on Slido by our uh, attendants, by our uh, audience. So if uh, the technicians could show us in the screen the questions, um, I could start to uh, pick those questions. I don't know if it is possible to see them on, on, the, on the screen. Yes. Okay. I will uh, start picking questions and uh, allocate to uh, the speakers. Um, 
let's start uh, with the first. Uh, how to make sure that women are accepted with their differences, of course, versus men, and continue acting as women, uh, as women while being uh, empowered. It's a very, a very interesting question. I'd like perhaps to he listen to uh, the views of some of you. I will start uh, uh, perhaps with Alisa. Alice, what can you uh, offer as uh, a reaction to this um, question raised by the audience? Well, uh, thank you, and thank you for the question. My first reflection is what what is acting as women? Uh, what what is that? Uh, I think the most important thing is an intersectional approach to these changes, so that we create uh, cultures where you can be different, and where we, uh, as uh, people with with powers to make a change also uh, identify what competences is needed. And the competences comes in different packages. Uh, and of course, being uh, a woman is uh, an experience that uh, the form is part of your competence. And then we need to create environments, working conditions where you can really uh, be brilliant with all your competences. Uh, so this is a, a big task. And just uh, like uh, Penty uh, earlier said, it's not easy. But the first thing uh, to do to be able to achieve it is the willingness uh, to change both cultures and structures that are lifting the cultures and then create these environments with, uh, where different competences can really uh, uh, work. Uh, but I think the intersectional approach is uh, the key to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, Penty, what can you tell us from a, a Nordic perspective and the experience that we just shared with us before? On this, in relation to this question, the same question. Yeah, actually, it's a little bit difficult to orient it that because uh, I, ha I have been in the energy sector over 30 years and, and I'm now working a lot more with women than, than men in our uh, department. So uh, it's uh, difficult to, to, to say that how, uh, how to improve the situation there. But if I try to think about more globally, uh, of course, it's it's an equality question of, of the whole society. It's, it's not special for energy sector. Of course, having old suited men in, in the in the direct in these companies and in these ministries is one one problem there uh, so uh, it, it has been uh, studies that if the ceo and the executive manager shows the attitude towards uh, equality and even actions for for example nokia director indian indian ceo promised after examination the Nokia company had that uh, there was some uh, lack uh, of, of uh, salaries between women and, and men. He promised at once and in, in, in three months they will uh, improve the situation. So I think this kind of actions are needed to, to give evidence that the, the company or the organization is this, this, this is your serious. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Pente. Um, I'd like now to move to this question of, uh, from your personal experience, as you climb through the career ladder, uh, shattering glass ceilings, how did you handle the criticism that comes with women being overly ambitious? I see a sign from Eva. Eva, you would like to, to uh, step in on this one? Yes, um, thank you. I find this question funny because it's usually you are not confronted with it yourself when people say this about you. People say this about other women. And if they say it to, about you, they, they say it to other people. So I've not been confronted with this about myself, but I heard it a lot about other women. And um, I think there's only there are two things that we can do about it. We can make people aware that they judge women differently than men because being ambitious in a in a career is seen as a good thing a good 
character um, uh, specialty for men. So why is it so negative for women? That means women and men are judged according to different criteria. And we should be fair. Um, in, a, in the modern job environment, it should be okay for women to be ambitious. And I think what we can do as women we, about it is talking well about other women, not talking badly about our competitors or people in our job environment, people who are our colleagues. We should um, stress their, um, their advantages and their skills and not focus on perhaps some negative aspects that they have. And I think like this, we can help each other. And I think women in the work environment have to support each other. Absolutely. Uh, no doubt. Could uh, Gotche or Christine like to comment on this one from your views? Well, um, I could add to that. I mean, I, I completely agree, but I, I actually could add to that. I think women uh, should, especially uh, for, for um, for those who have ambitions to be in leadership positions, they should actually be explicit about their um, ambitions. Um, they should make it very clear early on where they want to get, um, and that enables them to um, mentorship opportunities, professional development uh, opportunities, peer to peer learning. Um, so, actually, I, I don't see it as a criticism. I actually encourage women to, uh, if overly ambitious, be so and be explicit about it. Thank you, Goche. Um, perhaps I would pick up the next question. Uh, what do you think policies that can incentivize, incentivate women are paid equally uh, as men for doing the same job? We have heard before that this, uh, this is still a big issue uh, uh, in the world and, and, and still in Europe. Uh, even in Europe, only a few countries have salary uh, parity. Um, would you like to step in on this question, Christine? And then uh, I'll invite another panelist. Yeah, sure. I recall that I was attending, I think it was an SE for All forum, where they had the CEO of an as the Icelandic utility speaking, uh, and, uh, and they had have implemented the system where men and women are paid equally. And it was just something that was uh, implemented as part of the company policy uh, from top down. Uh, personally, I think that um, uh, it will not, I mean, we had at the, at the start, we had the question how long it will take us to reach gender parity. And the answer was, I think, 108 years. I think if this is not uh, put in legal action and if there are not um, obligations for quotas uh, for women in, in top management positions, uh, like at the moment, I mean, we have a, um, a commission that, is, uh, that is, uh, shows parity, which is great. But I think the reason for this is because uh, there is... Uh, the, the, the leadership uh, really uh, focused on, on these uh, gender parity aspects. So I think it is important to enshrine these uh, equal pay um, management targets, management quotas uh, in, in policies. Otherwise, uh, it might even take longer than the 108 uh, years uh, to get us there. Thank you. Alice, did you, would you like to step in on this? Uh on this topic i'd like to hear yes you. i would like to step in on every topic <laughs> I'm, all, I'm waving and waving i think one key to really uh, reach this goal is transparency i mean i can't believe that we haven't reached that yet of course we need transparency on on management level on what wages uh, people are getting because then it will be so clear and obvious for everyone that the women aren't earning as much for the same job, for the same responsibility, sometimes even for more responsibility than the colleagues that are men. So transparency, I think this is a, a key. And when I have been discussing this with leaders, they say, oh, no, uh, well, this is so private. It's not private. I mean, and if it's private, then it's political too, because if we don't have transparency, if we can't see, we need this all everywhere in, in society to make changes. We need facts, we need figures, we need transparency so that we can...
and say, this is wrong. Why is he earning more than she when she is doing more, have more responsibility and doing more than he is doing? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alicia. For sure, we have an opportunity with von der Leyen's commission to move this agenda forward. As we have heard from Eva, uh, the agenda is very ambitious and we will need a part, uh, the, the, the uh, parliament with us to move uh, this agenda forward for sure. Uh, uh, we have just been joined by my director general, uh, Dita. Dita, welcome to this discussion. Very pleased to have you with us. Uh, we have heard the panel, now we are on the Q&A and we have very interesting questions, so I will also address some of these to you if you, if you agree. Um, I'd like to pick up the one on universities and here I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, also Gochit for, for, uh, for a comment um, on the difference between men and women in, in universities uh, specialized in the energy sector. How could we help uh, women and, and encourage them to uh, to go to these universities? What can you tell us? I will be very precise and give two examples. Of course, there are many more. <clears throat> um, first one is we need dedicated scholarships. Um, a very good example is the Florence School of Regulations Lights on Women Scholarship. Um, it aims to support motivated early and mid-career women in their professional advancement um, with new and strengthened capabilities. And they do so uh, by providing free access to Florence School of Regulations, very valuable, very relevant uh, online courses. Um, the second thing I want to mention is that let's not forget you can't be what you can't see. So diversity um, in academic positions in universities, um, especially in those that have energy and climate uh, studies curriculum, is uh, of paramount importance for attracting um, young women to the sector. Um, I'll give you um, two good examples. Um, one is um, um, that has been employed last year by Eidenhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. Um, so for the duration of 18 months last year, they've opened all academic positions only for women. Um, to balance their gender, um, uh, to balance their gender equality um, in their per permanent staff, and they've also provided uh, an extra hundred thousand uh, funding for their research and mentorship. Second one, and we also need to um, give a platform for smaller initiatives, bottom-up initiatives. Uh, for instance, uh, at the Science Expo uh, in, in Paris, um, uh, we have a woman in energy network, a student-led network, and they invite uh, female professionals for guest lectures. And they're often, so we talk content, and they're often followed by an inclusive dialogue and gender equality. And this helps both male and female students become aware of the injustices that exist, but then also be informed about how to overcome these barriers by, by uh, these professionals uh, coming and sharing their experience. Thank you, Gotcha. Penti, can you share with us uh, the, your, I mean, your perspective from uh, the Nordic experience on this? Yes, yes, thank you, Paula. Yeah, this is a very common problem in, in the Nordic countries too, that the, Young people, not even girls, but even uh, even boys, are not so interested on in technical issues and uh, mathematics, and uh, they are mainly going to the media, information technology, uh, uh, legal legal universities or, or, or financing institutions. So, um, one one way we have tried to make this is, is campaigns before the application time uh, starts in the in springtime. There are social media campaigns, and then uh, universities hiring those uh, young young students, just starting, uh, mainly uh, women, to go around the, the, the high schools to showing that they they have managed to, to be there, and they are very very eager to learn more about technical practices. So this social media is quite effective there if if you want to promote these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Penty. Christine, I'd like to ask, in the, in the guidance that, uh, that you have, the network that you lead has produced on how to promote women talents in the sector, in the energy sector, do you also address the issue of uh, uh, scientific studies, access to universities? Yes, I, I mean, I fully agree with the two previous speakers. I think uh, one should not underestimate the importance of role models. 
I think it's important that that uh, young women and girls see uh, women work in this field. Uh, see, we have just recently also uh, done a campaign on uh, women entrepreneurs in sustainable energy, which we have particularly targeted at, in, at universities in order to uh, also uh, give students um, the, the option and the, and the choices that are out there. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, I would say we have just started to, to, to address this because our main uh, focus at the moment is uh, empowering women that are already in, uh, in the energy sector through mentorship programs, uh, for example. But um, it's a very important topic and I think it needs to be addressed systematically. Uh, also because what Eva has said before is that our education system and, and our general um, uh, society brings a lot, uh, brings about many uh, gender stereotypes. And I wouldn't say that they start in school. I would say that they start much earlier. I have a seven-month-old daughter, and I can tell you that it's not easy to not buy either pink or uh, blue clothes. So uh, you really have to dig deep in order to find something in gray or, or yellow or green. And uh, I'm sorry to say, but it starts already out there. And, uh, and then just continue. So I think we need to be very strategic in, in starting out from, uh, from the beginning, uh, just to, uh, to, to tell uh, young women and girls that the sky is the limit and, uh, and by giving them uh, lots of uh, role models so that they can see uh, that, that women can succeed in these areas and these are great areas to work in. Thank you, Christine. Eva, could you tell us, uh, in terms of the action program, um, to outline uh, those uh, upcoming actions to tackle this issue, what you have uh, in your uh, work plan when it comes to uh, incentivize uh, women to uh, access to, uh, to these uh, studies in, at university? So, um, yeah, there will, we are addressing this. There will be a digital education action plan. There will be an updated skills agenda for Europe. And we're, we are trying to address in all these policies to, to fight uh, segregation between women and men, to, to fight the stereotyping that we discussed before. Um, and then in education and training, we're trying to get more women in, in STEM studies because the, the strange thing is that we have 60% of university graduates are, uh, are women, but in the technical and uh, digital sector, the women are strongly underrepresented. So we're trying to address this. We're trying to have an EU-wide campaign on, on gender stereotyping. We're, we're, doing, uh, we're trying to address this in all sectors by media campaigns. The media also, they have a great outreach um, so we are financing a lot of uh, media campaigns um, across all sectors on equality, on women equality and on, you know, empowering women and giving them the strength and the, the confidence that they can also uh, be successful in technical sciences, mathematics and uh, in, in digital sciences and the IT sector. Thanks, Eva. I'd like now to pick one question that we have on the screen. How can we make the clean energy transition a vector of uh, women empowerment? And I'd like to ask Dita, would you like to uh, give your insights on this? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Paula, and thank you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to join. Uh, it sounds as if you've had a super interesting session. Um, and I know I, I'm told I'm no longer upside down on your screen, so I think that's, that's already an, an improvement as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think the, uh, um, the, uh, the clean energy transition is more than an energy transition. It's also a societal transition. It is about organizing ourselves and our societies, our economies, in a way that creates the best possible future for all of us and for future generations. And uh, equal opportunities is exactly the same. 
It is not about rights of the individual. As, some, as one of you just said, it's not, I think it was you, Gotcha, it's not a private issue, it's a societal issue. It is not about furthering women or, or society. It's about making sure that our society is the best possible society for everyone. Because only by drawing on our full uh, resources and on, our, on all of our talents, all of our skills from 100% of the society, only then can we get the best results. And so I think there's a strong correlation between the two. There's a strong similarity. And, and I think with the green transition, to answer the question more concretely, with the green transition, we're changing our energy system. We're building a future-oriented, uh, integrated energy system. We're making real changes in the way we do things, making better use of our resources. And whenever you are in a moment of a big change, whenever you are in a moment to review the way we operate, the way we work, the way our economy works, well, then that, that change is also an opportunity to build in other changes that are equally necessary, equally important to achieve the result. And here I think the green transition is a, is a, is a significant change. And it is therefore an opportunity to look at well, what else do we need to do to get the best result? Because if we want the best results for our planet, for the climate, for each of us individually and for our societies, we do need to address gender equality as well. And so we, we shouldn't let this opportunity go by. We need to, to take the opportunity and build equality into, into that as well. And I think if you look at the broader European Green Deal of the European Commission, if you look at the, the many um, uh, initiatives that are planned in there, these elements are well reflected. It's primarily reflected in the Just Transition Fund. And I know Just Transition Fund has nothing to do, or not directly rather, with, with equality. But it's the same thought. It is the same principle that we need to make sure that we bring everyone on board. We need to bring convergence throughout Europe. We need to make sure that no one suffers from energy poverty. We need to make sure that everyone can go through this transition and make the best of it. And here I see equality as a very important component as well. So we need to build those reflections into what we do every day, essentially. Thank you so much, Dita, for sure. Uh, we have a, a chance now to uh, balance uh, uh, the gender in, in the sector with the, with the transition, no doubt, with all these tools that the Commission has put forward also for the recovery. Uh, there is a huge opportunity also to uh, to have impacts on, on, on the balance. Alice, I think I see that you are, yes, you would like to take the floor, please. Yes, because I, I really appreciate what is said, and I think this whole discussion is so interesting because it makes everything very clear. I mean, all of us, I mean, all of us uh, uh, in the panel, and I'm sure uh, the broad majority of everybody that uh, takes part of this uh, seminar, we have the facts. We all what a big, a great chance this green transition can be also when it comes to empowering women. We all, we have the facts. So you must wonder, what's the problem then? I mean, this is not something new. We have known this forever. The pr problem is that there still are too many people, persons, uh, mostly men with power that doesn't want to make the change. I mean, and I think it's so important that we really identify this problem because we will sit here having the same discussion in one year, in five years, and in 10 years, because there will still be people with, with power who are not willing to make the changes. And we will still have the same facts. And that, I think, we maybe now we have the chance to reach the tipping point because the facts are all there. We are living in a climate uh, catastrophe. So we need now to make sure that those people sitting with powers and are not willing to share them, that they must understand that it's time to, to say goodbye and make the real change. Thank you. Alice, Eva, I said you want to react to this. Yes, many thanks uh, for, for, for this comment and um, absolutely agree. And in order to have more women in power and in order to have women in decision-making positions, especially in the energy sector, we need to adapt this, to adopt this women on board directive. Because there are so many energy companies across Europe and so many member states that have only male boards. And there's only men deciding about the future of the company, about the pricing of this company, about who this company is buying about in which in which sectors this company is going 
uh, are they going into more renewable or are they reducing renewable and uh, are buying oil? These decisions are to a vast majority in Europe taken by men. And they, the Women on Board Directive says that the underrepresented sex, doesn't have to be the woman, um, should be represented in a board. There's the, these are not set quotas, but these are targets. So companies can give themselves targets. But uh, this voluntary target setting is also something that where we have to be a little bit careful because in Germany we have it. And in Germany, companies can set themselves targets for women on board. And 70% of companies have set themselves a target of zero. So the target is zero women on board. That's a great success. That's an ambitious target. So we believe without regulation, it won't fly. It won't go. And we need women taking decisions about the future <clears throat> because this is the future of Europe and the future of our planet when it comes to, to energy decisions. Thanks, Eva. I also think that the peer pressure and uh, the best practice, if we could communicate on the best practice and the good results of, of a change, I think it would also be, uh, could also help in that direction. I see Christine, but before then, I'll give the floor to Penty because you asked the floor, Penty, right? And then I'll come to you, Christine. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, just, just mentioning that we had a workshop on women and energy during a set plan conference in November in Helsinki organized with, uh, together with commission and there was one proposal in this workshop and it was that when hiring people to the leading positions one qualification criteria should be evidence for activities for gender equality so silent uh, invisible support is not enough so this is good i think advice for the public organization even to the commission to to, to give this as one, one criteria when choosing people in, in higher positions. Thank you. Thanks, Panty. Uh, Christine. Thank you very much, Paula. Uh, when we did our study, we, we looked through literature and it's evident that uh, equality improves uh, GDP, improve, uh, diverse leadership leads to better results. And I think this is something that needs to be communicated. Uh, we see that companies with diverse leadership are better prepared to survive financial shocks. They have improved profitability. They are better prepared to innovation. Uh, they are also mostly better on uh, environmental issues uh, because they have more stringent decarbonisation policies. And uh, I'm sure, uh, I mean, I don't know yet, but I'm sure studies will be done. I'm sure that companies with diverse leadership would also better survive uh, the current pandemic. Uh, and, and I think uh, it is important to also emphasize this argument because at the end of the day, companies, uh, they, they are there to make money. And if uh, this is becoming uh, common knowledge that uh, diversity increases uh, profits, uh, and that's in general uh, the case, not only in the energy sector, uh, there is there's not only the issue, of course, it's a human right that, we, that women participate on an equal basis as men, but uh, it's also better for the overall results of the companies. Thank you, Christine. Uh, gotcha. Um, I would like to just add that um, indeed best practices are key and at the WCS we are exactly um, gathering uh, best practices on uh, from companies that adopt um, um, an approach to make sure that their leaders think in a diverse way and there are some training programs um, that have step-by-step -step guides um, to mitigate unconscious bias at the leadership level. So when leaders are making decisions, they don't only ask around their peers, but they uh, have an intersectional approach. Um, and indeed, I agree with Kristen, companies with diversified um, sort of workforce, uh, um, there is higher margins for sure, but they also understand the, the, the clients, the communities they serve better because society is diverse. Um, and, and another thing at the WDCS uh, in that respect that we are looking at the um, possibility of developing specific methodologies for gender impact assessments, similar to environmental impact assessment, to make sure that uh, women are included in the decision making uh, related to energy uh, projects as a stakeholder, because research that we've already carried out shows that women are not even included in most stakeholder groups. Thank you. 
that's an interesting um, an interesting statement, uh, Koche. Uh, I see one specific, very specific question coming from the audience asking about data and examples of projects in successful women inclusion in the climate energy transition in the EU. Um, what can we, uh, how can we direct uh, this uh, uh, EMINA uh, for uh, interesting projects? Christine, Goce, Penti? Uh, I mean, I, 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 of course, there are many aspects to this, but I would just add, add one thing. Um, throughout my career, I have been on numerous conferences, especially in the energy field, not organized by the Commission, but organized by other actors that were only, that were manals, that were only men. Uh, we have uh, started an initiative last year. Uh, we have created the Women in Energy Expert Platform, where women can create their profiles, showcase their experience, um, can network among each other and uh, and, and and can really uh, say that they are they are out there for giving presentations, etc. Uh, we actively promote this with conference organizers. Have lots of requests from there, and already have more than one thousand two hundred profiles with from women in ninety countries. Uh, I think this is one way. Um, it is important to give women the visibility. Uh, they often lack this, and, and I think uh, panels like today uh, are, uh, are, are nearly already the other extreme. That's why I'm particularly happy that, uh, that uh, Penti is here with us, because I think it's not an issue uh, that only concerns women. We also need the men, and um, that's just one aspect of, uh, I'm sure, the many uh, that are needed uh, to become uh, the, the champion for uh, for, for gender balance in the energy sector. Thank you. Thanks, Christine and Panty. Would you like to step in on this? Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. I, I don't just here have some evidence of the projects uh, with, with uh, women involved to, to have a good results. But one, one good project, project I'm involved is CE3 in, in Clean Energy Ministerial. There are nine countries uh, like Canada, Sweden, Austria, Australia, uh, Finland, Italy, some others involved. And uh, we, we have uh, promised to produce the data how the equal issues are going, going in our countries. And uh, also we have the campaign of Equal by 30. The, the governments can join, uh, organizations can join, and, and the uh, industries, uh, companies can join. And, they have to report how their salary is coming equal by 2030 in these, these who are taking uh, taking part of this campaign. And, and, and I'm pleased to say that the, the campaign is led by women and it's running very well. There are over 100 companies and, and something like uh, uh, 10 countries involved. And, and, and I think this transparency issue there we are trying to, to improve is, is one key point to get results. Uh, always, if you don't can't follow up and you can't measure, uh, it's very very important, uh, very difficult to achieve your target. So now we are having the basic data and we are started to, to progress towards the equality by thirty. So join, please join. Even Commission can join this because they are the member of the Ministry. Thank you. Thank you. And one last question. We have time for one last question. And I would like to pick up the one about stereotypes. Uh, it was referred during the panel uh, interventions. And there is a specific question on how the EU, so this is a, a question to our uh, two ladies from the Commission, how the EU will support the decrease of stereotypes, for instance, school books, other materials, but we can even go further than that. Um, Eva, Dita, who would like to uh, Kickstart. I see also a, a wide room, ample room for also for education and training here. Give you the floor, Eva. I think I said already quite a lot what we can do about uh, stereotypes. So um, the media campaign um, that, that I addressed. Um, I would like to say, <laughs> to say something that um, to the question that we had before, if possible, apologies for this, eh? because on the question how we how we can implement a gender perspective into energy policies, 
I wanted to give a concrete example. Um, we know from research that women do more, take more sustainable choices. We, we have multiple studies on this. And for example, we, take, we have more women taking public transport um, than men. But um, in public transport, we have a security issue because women, when it's late in the night and they have to wait at a dark bus stop um, that, that doesn't have a lot of light, they might rather take a taxi and that is less sustainable. So here, this is a clear example where we have to take a gender dimension into our transport policies in order to make a transport so available for women and safe enough so that everyone is safe to take sustainable choices that are good for, for the climate. So, and apologies, I'm, I'm, uh, I didn't answer the question, but I really wanted to, <laughs> to make this comment at an, at an earlier stage. Uh, Dita, would you like to step in on the, perhaps on how we are tackling it from a, a working methods uh, uh, um, perspective in the Commission? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Paula, and I think it is indeed a great point about the stereotypes which is something we have to build into everything we do uh, on gender and into, into all of our policies. I would say from the side of the Commission specifically, we first of all need to make sure that we don't fall into the stereotype trap. So when we make uh, information material, when we go on the podium, when we set up panels, that we do not use uh, stereotype, I don't know, um, illustrations in, in our publications, or because there's a lot of that and we rarely uh, realize that it's stereotyping because it's the normal we're used to. Um, then I think we need to work, and, and this is a more challenging thing, but I think uh, we need to work on the perception. One of you mentioned the concern about buying pink girls' clothes and that it's very difficult to avoid. But pink is not the problem. The problem is how pink is perceived. So I think we need to make pink great again <laughs> in, a, in a bad uh, use of words. But, but the, that... that why would that ever be a problem that somebody likes to look like a princess or likes to wear a dress or like to wear pink? And so I think we also need to work on our own perceptions around that. And for that, I think our role models are extremely important. We have in the commission uh, a, a, a set of excellent female leaders, starting with our president, uh, executive vice president, vice presidents, and our own energy commissioner, Kathy Simpson. And so I think we're, we're in a lucky time in, in history and in Europe that we have these role models. Um, that show that uh, you can have great power, uh, be decisive, do very good things for Europe, and lead people uh, in a in a female way as a human being, but as a female as well. And I think those role models will be extremely important in in bringing about change. Thank you very much, Dieter, and thank you very much for the discussion. I think we are coming to an end of our panel discussion. And before passing the floor to Dieter for a final closure, I would like to invite you and the audience to write a word of two and use Slido for that uh, on what you think has been the main takeaway uh, for today. So um, please don't hesitate. Put your one or two words that you retain from, uh, from today's uh, uh, webinar. Can our technicians uh, show um, the wording? I think we have already a lot huh, here, although few words, but very strong words. And I thank you very much for that. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like now to uh, to give the floor to Dita, but before then, please don't forget uh, after the event to uh, fill in the Slido survey. It's very quick, quickly done. And it's important uh, so that we can have feedback on, on this event. And, uh, and uh, it is important for us to know your thoughts so that we can uh, uh, improve even more uh, for, the next, uh, for the next occasion. Thank you very much. And now the floor is yours, Dita. Thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you very much to the excellent panelists, and thank you to everyone who has who has joined this important session uh, today. Um, I'm looking at the looking at the word cloud, and I'm very very happy to see that transparency uh, is a is a lead word that everyone agrees that we need transparency, and I think that's a great starting point and a great conclusion to uh, to this panel uh, debate, together with role models and together with the need for for support. Uh, and action, because we need to be concrete, we need to do things, we need to be operational to get results, as, um, as Penti also said in one, of your, in one of your replies. But transparency is at the core of it. Unless we talk about it, unless we raise awareness, uh, we're not going to change things. We need to be, uh, we need to be uh, clear that there is an issue. As long as uh, we pretend that it's simply a normal, that it's simply a fact that there are fewer women on panels and jobs and representative positions, then we are buying into to a lack of change. So to make change, we need transparency uh, and we need to take action and, and we need role models to, to help us do that. As I said in, in one of my replies, I think uh, the green transition, the European Green Deal and the green energy transition is more than just an energy transition. It's also about changing our societies and our economy, the way we work, making it more sustainable, more resilient, making it fairer across Europe and across uh, uh, people um, in Europe. And so it really is about new opportunities, new jobs, including jobs in the energy sector and jobs for women, and new possibilities, and finding a place to find these new solutions. And so, as I said, I think there's a strong synergy between this transition and the, and the equality transition, the societal change that we need for both of them. So what can we do concretely uh, in Europe and what can you do concretely? Um, we, need, uh, we need to be active, we need to take action. Uh, to reduce the, the imbalance and, and we need to be better, I think, at valuing the specific contribution of women. Some of you have pointed to that. Eva, you had some specific points on that. That is a value. Pink is a value, so to say. <laughs> uh, we need to establish partnerships. We need to have partnerships with academia to understand better the magnitude of the problem, uh, to have the data that is needed to address the problem. Uh, and to get inspiration, of course, also from other sectors, what are the possible solutions that they have found uh, that we can benefit from also in the energy sector. We need networks. We need you, Christina, Gertrude, people like you, the networks you have set up, the work you are doing to help find solutions, to help bring attention to the problems, uh, to describe the problems so that we know that we work off a, a good fact-based uh, analysis and, and knowledge of what is actually going on. And then we have, of course, the energy sector itself, where a lot can happen. It's traditionally been an imbalanced sector in a, from a gender perspective, at least. Um, that's changed in some, in some parts of the energy sector, but a lot more needs to be done. And so I think there's a question, do we need to have a, a platform for women in energy? Uh, what do we do? Do we need voluntary commitments? What is the toolbox that we can pick from Penti? You had some suggestions there about concrete action. Um, and I think we need to look at, can we do that with the energy sector to make changes here? Then the role models, um, as I mentioned, we need to continue to promote role models. We need to make sure that there's space for these role models to be seen and to be out there and to be part of the debate and part of the work. One of the things we have done uh, there, and I'm very, very happy with this in this first uh, edition uh, we have launched now on the, um, of the Women in Energy Awards, uh, which was launched here sorry, at the European Sustainable Energy Week, and where we have recognized work of three exceptional and strong women. And I'm very, very happy to do that because I think that creation of role models, that uh, transparency, that knowledge about what these excellent and strong women do uh, is exactly what we need. As so I would like to thank and congratulate also Sophia Tali, Ada Alman and Katarina Habersbrunner for their excellent work and congratulations with the, with the awards this year. We look forward to seeing what you can do to support and strengthen the role of women uh, in energy and the energy transition. And then I think we need to continue to use opportunities to organize sessions like this on women in energy, uh, women in, in the economy, uh, to have parts of that. And whenever we do events, that we remember that this is an important aspect to, to look at. And I know Eva has been working and, and thinking along those lines as well. And so I'm very happy that we have you there on equality issues in Europe, um, Eva. We need, of course, and that's the obvious, we need to be absolutely clear about uh, representative and representation in, in panels. We cannot have uh, panels of only men or only, only women. We need them to be uh, representative. Then we, we talked about the stereotyping. There is a bias and we need to address the bias also in the workplace locally with each of us. What we have done in DGNR and Paula, this is very much thanks uh, to you, 
is we have established an NRA quality network. Um, and I know you mentioned it earlier in the event today and you've talked about it, but this is absolutely uh, crucial both to bring awareness about the issues, but again, also to establish knowledge uh, and facts. We have done a survey. We're really looking into, well, what are the issues? What are the issues that colleagues experience? If we don't know what it is, we can't address it. So we need to, to strengthen our, our knowledge base and do something about that. Um, and again, Eva, we're supported by Commissioner Daly and, and her team uh, today with, uh, with, with you. And then we need, of course, to mainstream equality, gender equality into our energy policies. Again, so I said to, to pick it up in all the different aspects of work, uh, we have to make sure we look at this aspect and um, this, this angle as well. And as one of you have said, to get better results. Because again, it is, it is not an agenda for women or for men. It is an agenda for our societies, for Europe, in getting the best results, both for companies on the, uh, in, in terms of the economic results, the financial results, but also as societies in getting the best results for everyone. So thank you very much for uh, your contribution. Thank you very much for the excellent debate um, and, uh, and, the, and the good ideas that we look forward to following up on.